Once the window is open, go to the bottom and click the raise hand. The chair will call on you and you may uh, unmute your mic. Please identify yourself with your name, address, for the record. You can also raise your hand from your phone by dialing star nine. If you haven't already done so, please identify yourself on the screen, which I think everyone has. Thank you very much. Um, all video screens will be turned off with the exception of the commission dealer and the current petitioner. Once the commission has acted upon an application, of course, the petitioner is free to leave the meeting. Screen sharing will not be promoted unless absolutely necessary. All votes will be taken by roll call. In the event that this meeting is Zoom bombed or we're not able to get control of the meeting back, all matters on the agenda that have not been heard will automatically continue to the next available meeting, which will probably be in a couple of Wednesdays. This is being uh, recorded, and if anyone out there is recording, please get permission from the chair to do so. Um, and at this time, I'll, do, I'll, I'll call the roll of the commission. Uh, Nick Pappas? Unmute, please, Nick. Okay, Nick Pappas here. Uh, Judy? Judy Zahnbrecher here. Thank you, and I'm Greg Higgins, and I'm here. And that is a quorum, and that's how we're going to run this meeting. Um, first on the agenda, we need a motion, guys, for these continuances. If somebody would jump in and do that for me, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Nick, could you do it? I'm still having computer problems and can't pull them up. Hold on one second. For it, just a moment. Here we go. Okay, I uh, move that we continue to, uh, without discussion, to July 22nd, uh, NOI application, Core States Group, 1134 Main Street, DEP file number not yet issued. Also, okay. notice of intent application, Shaw, 43 Old Bedford Road, DEP file number 1371504. Also, notice of intent application Walsh, 150 Garfield Road, DEP file number 1371524. And notice of intent application Town of Concord, 369 38A and 40A Commonwealth Avenue, DEP file number 1371522. Looking for a second, Judy? Second. Um, roll, I have to roll call this. All those in favor, Nick? Aye. Judy? Aye. And I am aye, making it unanimous. Uh, now we go to our first agenda item of the, of the evening, one three, file number 137-1525, 396 Great Meadow Road. And I saw Molly on there. Are you doing this one, Molly? I am, yes. All right, let's see. Where are we in this? All right. Um, for the record, Molly Bendorf with Stamsky McNary. Thank you. I um, we submitted a revised plan after the last meeting, um, responding to some comments from the commission and Colleen and Delia. Yep. Um, so we have since updated the plan to include a detail for the court and steel edging. Um, and we've also identified stockpile locations on the plan. Um, yep. Additionally, a uh, septic plan was submitted to the Board of Health. We did receive approval from that. Um, and lastly, um, phasing for both phase one and phase two, um, have been provided also a quantified list by zone and size of species of trees has been provided as well. Um, we did get some additional comments from Colleen, um, just to update on the natural heritage status. Uh, so the, the turtle protection is that's in, in um, the fence is up that's in working condition um, and Kyle Cormier with Oxbow Associates um, said as long as that's maintained and the gate is closed at the end of each day then we should be all set on that we did receive approval from natural natural heritage on that um, Sally the botanical survey she submitted at the beginning of this month um, and <coughs> I haven't heard anything back from her yet so um, I don't know what exactly the process is with that, um, but we're, we're okay. still waiting for approval from Natural Heritage on that. Okay. Uh, and there was a comment about um, the, the plantings and needing more or larger sizes. I will right. let 
Gail and Miles get into that. Okay. Uh, now, it, just one question I had for you. I think it would be your, in your in your uh, court is the phasing part of it. We intend on getting the invasive work done in phase one. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I believe so. so yeah. So, so that will. We ought to just get that straightened right out so we know exactly what's happening in each phase. Okay, yeah, we'll include, there was another comment by Colleen to update the phasing plan to include invasive species removal, so. Yeah, yeah. We'll and, provide and, that. Okay, so are, those folks are here, correct? Yes. About the planning? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just from a, from a commission standpoint, I think the number that you're replacing might work if, if the trees happen to be species that would replicate what is currently there in terms of size and eventual volume, but that's not the case. So we're kind of throwing it out to you. Would you consider uh, putting in some of those or would you consider <coughs> putting in more so that we have the sort of a balance in um, what was lost? That's, I think, where we're coming from. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, this is Miles Connors from Parterre Ecological that's going to address- Hi, Miles. Um, so, I, um, Gail and I have been working together on this project and putting together this uh, planting plan. A big challenge, obviously, in this on site as a whole, especially in the phase two area, is grades. Um, we <clears throat> have a, you know, fairly steep slope that leads down, uh, straight down to a wetland edge at the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. In looking at the site, we are we have actually met the the bylaw condition um, of the town in terms of replacement uh, one for one replacement. Um, and obviously, there are some larger trees that are coming out uh, with some smaller trees going back in. We have uh, we have you know basically like a uh, as, as tall as a tree that. You know, comfortable to move down to the base of the hill, like at this time. Um, we have like really like a four to six foot um, tree well, on different, a couple of different sizes on here. Uh, if I could just interrupt sure. for, ten, for a second, Miles, it might, to clarify what I'm saying is, I don't expect you to put back a 70 foot tree, but, but the issue was that if you take out a tree that grows to 70 or 80 feet, you, and put back a tree that, that maxes out at 25, that that is a little bit of a stretch on the one to one, especially when it when the number of trees is virtually the same you're putting in. That that was the question. Not that I, we would ever expect you to be able to to put a tree of, of of the size you're going out in. It's just you know in 20 years, what would it would it have the the chances of replicating what you took out? So you're speaking about more about the mature. I'm saying that if you've got an 80 foot tree in there, it would be nice to put a, a, a replace it with a tree that has a chance to grow to 50 to 60 to 70 okay. feet in its yeah. maturity. That's what I'm saying. In the heavens, we're not asking you to put a 60 or 70 foot tree in. Jeez. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that can that can certainly uh, be something that we that we take into serious consideration, obviously. There but the, alter the alternative would be is to add a few more trees, which one we could you know, maybe maybe live with it. I have to get the commission to agree with me, but we might be able to live with that if you said, hey, we're going to up it by X number of trees and, and not put any ones in there because it they just may be the wrong kind of trees to put in, 80 footers, you know. That's kind of your, it's in your court to decide probably as an expert what kind of tree should actually be there. And if it is the shorter ones in mature, when they mature out, then maybe you add a couple more and we and we can live with them. Is that how you feel, Judy? I'm just... Yes. Yeah. I was noticing the same thing when I was looking through the trees being put in. Yeah. So it's just, it's giving you a little bit of an option as to how you want to mm -hmm. handle it, you know? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we're not trying to, you know, come just give us something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, part, of the, part of the reasoning, just to go back on like, you know, some of the trees that we decided on, you know, the existing site conditions, you have... Uh, very tall mass species that are all very mature, right? You have white pines, uh, red oak, some white oak, that are interesting understories. So they're all mass species in that location. And, yeah. you, and along the driveway approach, that's ultimately what you see. The, the shrub layer 
um, on site is essentially like along the wetland edge where you have a great deal of like alder, you have some high blueberries, um, et cetera. So, you, you know, part of, the, part of the reasoning behind the smaller tree species is looking for understory trees that are more of like on that shrub size layer to okay. just diversify the site. Um, but certainly, you, you know, and the layers of uh, vegetation as you, as you come in. Uh, but certainly we could replace, um, you know, some of the like dogwoods and, or, you know, uh, birches or, or other, even some of the amelanchias with something that is, um, you know, more of a mass tree species like the oaks or white pines or other plant species, existing tree species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, we, uh, uh, but that said, we want to make sure we do what is correct in there and not have trees that are going to crowd one another out and both die 14 years from now, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're sort of the expert as to advising all of us. We're just saying if we could balance off the, the, the loss of, to offset it just to some extent, you're not going to put in, you know, all those tall trees. Yeah. Okay. Very all good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we can do something like that and you bring it back, I mean, is every, is the rest of the Nick, are you okay with that? If you can, question about, I haven't been to the site but uh, is the miles is the existing site pretty much second growth forest which everything's the same height uh, yeah I would yeah they're all very mature trees that are through there I mean, some of them are even are even like past their prime in decline right. and they, all more or less, they all more or less grew up together and sort of sparse at the lower levels and that like that that's correct okay yep. So, so a, sort of a mixed, a mixture of uh, lower growing and some that might grow high might be appropriate just to get a more balance into the, into the forest. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, that's, I think, you know, if we, those are the two issues that Miles and Molly that we had um, so that we can just push this thing and get rid of it. So if you, if you can get the notes in there about the phase, you know, the phasing, staff to uh, okay and then um, Miles if you can you know give opine on what should be there and why um, and add you know either add more or, or throw in a couple of ones that'll mature bigger I think we can, does everybody agree we can sort of move this along the yep. yeah yeah and I would even I would even add I mean is there a possibility of adding you know that as a note as a, as a special condition you know, pre, you know, meeting or something like that. So we, so we can move this along. Um, it would be really against the, uh, all of our policies to sign off okay. on, on something with that, with not, okay, you know, it's, it sounds, it sounds fine in this situation. I'm sure it would work, but it, it, it would make a precedent that might uh, give us conflicts down mm -hmm. with other petitioners that, you know, keep, they just keep pushing that envelope till the envelope bursts. You know? I would love to say yes, frankly, but uh, I think if you can do that, I, it may be yeah, the case you. where if you can do that and get it into staff, you know, you may you may not even have to return on the 22nd. We can just get staff saying, "Yep, you did it," and let's mm -hmm. just move it and 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 and, and issue. So it's not. Um, it's I guess it's just a formality. The 22nd. Okay, and I know that Gail actually made some updates to her plan. You know, based on the comments, I don't know if those are available to be viewed tonight, this evening. We don't have those any updates. Okay. Yeah. And and looks like we're still looking for NHESP approval. Not yes. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we don't have that yet anyway. So okay. we're very good. That we're we're hanging out. They would always be contingent on that anyway. So yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, um, I, I think we're I think we're okay for the evening, and I'm I'm sorry you have to you know we get one more meeting, but I guess that's just the way cookie crumbles, right? No, thank it's you always nice to see you all. And we'll continue. Thank you, Miles, and thank you, Molly. And we'll okay, continue. thank you, thank you so much. We're thank you guys. Continue. So your request, we're continuing to the twenty second. Great. Left. Thank yep, you. That works. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is not Silver Hill, is it? It's one forty one. Yeah. My excellent, excellent. It is Silver Hill. I got mine out of order because I've been reading them. All 
All right. After, next up is uh, DEP file number 1371527, 22A and 25A, Silver Hill Road. Um, it, seem, it seems we've got most of what we need. Uh, who's out there that's ready to talk? Please identify yourself. Hello. I think um, Paul Van Kutsemi, I'm the, the president of the association, but I'll Hi. let David David talk because he, has, he is the specialist and he's the yes. one who sent you the information. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. David, are you there? Uh, I'm sorry, Greg, can I just interrupt for one second? There's um, somebody that's on the call that is not identified. Um, I can't I can't see that because you've got the thing up on the screen, but okay, so there's, if you're um, on the call, if you're on the call, please, and you're and you're you don't have your first and last name up there, we request that you do that and you do that by pressing in the top right hand corner of the screen. There's three uh, blue buttons, they call them carrots, I guess. If you press on that, it'll say rename and you're able to type in your name. We, we would appreciate that. We need that for the record. Um, uh, we're not- uh, G-I-E-D-R-E. -E. If you could just go to the top of your photo and click on those carrots so that you rename yourself for the record, that would be great. Thank you. All right, is David there? Uh, yes, I had to find the uh, unmute button. We're good. So okay, David, great. <laughs> uh, yeah. David Roach uh, with All Habitat Services, Brantford, Connecticut, uh, appearing on behalf of the Silver Hill Association. Yep. Um, so well, uh, uh, following uh, last meeting, uh, there were some uh, requests uh, for additional information, um, which I believe we've submitted um, uh, the items that were requested. Um, I think the primary uh, concern was uh, a, an updated map of the uh, surface vegetation and the Phragmites. Um, yeah. I think we had a, a very practical solution to collect some drone photography uh, and then um, extrapolate that into the map. And this was a representation uh, of the surface vegetation that was present uh, at that time. So uh, lilies are, are sort of developing. Um, um, so this is, this is what was available at the time and that's depicted in red. Uh, the green um, to the north of that is, uh, is the Phragmites. And what you're seeing is there's just some transparency in that, but that, that area, that outline is, is um, is solid, fa fairly solid uh, Phragmites infestation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so okay. that's been depicted. And then um, we provided a description of the um, type of equipment that we'd be using. Um, and some of that's going to depend on time of year and conditions. Um, but it would either be done, if it can be done on foot, it would be done on foot. Uh, if not, uh, we have low ground pressure equipment um, uh, it's, it's known, uh, as a marsh master. Um, and this would be something that we would use for, uh, mowing or accessing, uh, to perform the herbicide application. If this is not, uh, accessible on foot, um, this is routinely used in Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, a lot of, a lot of places across the country. Um, <laughs> It's about a, it's, it's approximately one half of a uh, PSI uh, pressure, which is, is insignificant on the peat layer. Um, and it would be done typically in the low wildlife use times. So, um, which is then that's been described <coughs> the, um, in the, the description of the, the Phragmites management efforts. So um, we, we'd like to do it on foot. I just don't know you know, what time of year, what we're going to see, it may not be accessible. So I understand. Uh, that's so, and then I think um, we're also looking for the MISA data, which we provided. And uh, yeah. Delia, was there um, one other item? Uh, you've said, so there was the, uh, the 
You've submitted it. We had asked for a signature on the application as well as the documentation of the MEPA submittal, which is okay, it was the signature was provided. So, so all of that administrative piece of it is, is all set. Thank you. And you're in coordination with the town in terms of the t roadway, the dumping the stuff in. The one, the one item that, um, in terms of your um, monitoring, uh, you know, a formal approach. Are you? I guess would you do a base, a base study right now assessment, and then do it uh, post treatment, and then uh, occasionally would you recommend? So that we can have sort of a read of how successful, or I assume I'm using the word successful because I'm hopeful um, that we're that that this treatment is is that is that what you're suggesting? Because we ought to have that sort of spelled out. Right. So we we do a a pre uh, pre and post monitoring. Yeah. Um, we and we do want to develop a baseline. This is something that um, the association's been doing prior to our engagement. They've got water quality data. Um, they've, they've been at this, uh, I think <laughs> 10, 10 years or so, Paul, that sounds about right. Pretty much. Yep. Okay. So, um, you know, and they, and they've employed a variety of different, uh, techniques. So we would really say that this is an accomplished integrated management effort. Uh, Greg, if I may, I had a quick question on the, the monitoring, the, the chemistry, um, does do the, the weather conditions impact the results very much like, um, you know, over the last couple of days, we just had a lot of rain, uh, which I assume flushed a lot of things into the pond. Does that type of thing have an impact on your, your monitoring program? So in terms of water quality? So, yeah. Yeah, so that's a swimming beach. Um, so were you concerned about bacteria? Are you talking about, about nutrients? Um, I was just concerned about um, the results that would be monitored, um, how those baseline conditions may lead to variation in your results, <coughs> which make it hard to, to interpret. Um, you know, we typically see, you know, if, if you do have a, a heavy rain event and there is a spike in nutrients, um, that's, that's typically um, the signature would, would remain constant in that area. So if you, if you have a, an inflow that, that is contributing nutrients, that would identify itself readily um, through a variety of ways, presence of algae, present, you know, heavy presence of weed growth. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a trace signature that you would see. Um, other than that, it really is gonna balance out in the overall pond and the, the plants within the pond are gonna, are gonna mediate that. Um, oh, but okay. we, would, we would tend to notice, you know, if, for example, if, if that inflow stream was rich, um, mm -hmm. there'd be a rich community of vegetation, there'd be a, a, a pattern of algae. Um, it, it, would, it, would, it would produce a very noticeable signature. And mm -hmm. then other than that, it is gonna, because there is some flow through the pond in the, in the higher flow periods, um, that would distribute itself. And then the rest of the pond would, would process that through the okay. vegetation. It's, it's a little cryptic. Um, you know, it's, it's either very obvious or not at all, you know. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we spend a lot of time chasing nutrients and trying to figure out where they are in the cycle. It's, it's not, it, it, there's very few times you come up with a smoking gun. If you do, it's very bad. Yeah. Um, so, so are we all, are we set at deal you with, with the, um, monitoring program or do you need to see something a little more definitive or? So we, we did prepare an order of conditions that includes a monitoring program that's a, a, in post David of the water quality, as well as, um, a baseline of the, uh, vegetation, which you've provided, um, and then annual monitoring reports, which is standard for the session to to be okay. provided with okay so the if you are ready to issue an order uh commissioners that is uh that has been prepared well okay so yeah i guess i guess it, it just understand um that that will be part of the order 
should we vote in that regard that you'll, you know, which is sta pretty standard procedure for us. But what I must, any other questions from the commissioners? No. No. Uh, is anyone out there in the wide world who wish to comment here? Please, please do so now. I'll give you a couple of seconds because it, you may have gone to the fridge to get a cold drink or something. Judy, if you would be so kind, and we do have order of conditions, it would be nice to get. Right, yeah. Kind of me. I, I, hear, I hear just, just officially, I don't see anybody raising their hand or coming forward. So I think okay. we'll go to the next phase. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. I make a motion to issue an order of conditions for DEP file 137. Which, just a second here. My computer screen went blank. Uh, I've got, got it if you want, Judy. Yeah. Oh, well, I've got it back. Sorry. Um, I make a motion uh, to order to issue an order of conditions for DEP file 137 1527 for Silver Hill Homeowners Association 2020, uh, 22A 25A Silver Hill Road with uh, finding A, standard conditions one through 19, special conditions 20 through 43. Do I hear a second? Second. Nick seconded, I uh, now I'll uh, roll call. Nick, how say you? Aye. Judy? Aye. And I am I as well. Um, and that's unanimous, so the order of conditions is issued. Thank you, David. Thank you, Paul, very much. And uh, Thank you much, guys. Thank sounds you. like you're going to do it. Sounds like you're doing a great job. Seriously, thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, moving along, uh, I guess we don't have a file number on this. It is still done. <coughs> um, 141 Comerford Road. Um, is James here, or is somebody from Stamsky here? Is that John? Uh, yes, John Jankopoulos here, representing Hi, John. Colombo. Okay, you were you were muted there. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Uh, it seems like you've done a lot of good work, so let's just get right at covering it. Yeah, thank you very much. We um, took the commission's comments. Um, I've been um, working uh, with Stansky McNary to uh, revamp this, and um, in general, what we've uh, accomplished is. We've trimmed down the existing driveway. We've made some modifications to the proposed driveway. We've eliminated the um, shoulder of Comerford Road um, improvement that we had um, planned. Yep. And um, I think we've uh, accomplished a net reduction of 26 square feet in the encroachment in the riverfront. So we've taken a project that um, add a significant increase to one that's um, essentially uh, neutral and yeah. slightly red up, reduced. Uh, and we are replanting some of the uh, grassy areas to accomplish that, as well as the reduction in the uh, driveway that exists. Uh, thank you. Um, one item which is fairly minor, but should be mentioned, uh, staff noticed on the plan, it's very hard to see on the size that we get, but um, you're going to have to put some protection measures in on some of the trees in there working around them. They yes, there's might... a note. There is a note. I think it's mm -hmm. note uh, five or six on the left hand corner there that does talk about tree uh, armoring. Uh, sorry, note three, I believe. Uh, George, I see it. Yeah, we... so it would be helpful just to have a detail if, of what you're proposing. If you, if, for. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you just I don't know. Yeah, you show where it is. What the detail of that is? You know, what do you what what do you plan on doing to armor the tree? In other words, certainly. Um, I'll I'll discuss it with the engineer, and I can just, um, just throw something on. Just put it on the plan, and you know, put you know an inset. And yep, you bet. Let's not make a deal out of that. Um, if you would, if if we could review the area, and I have a reason for asking this. If we could review the area of mitigation. Um, I, it brings up a question that I have, but I want to review that first. In terms of doing mitigation, um, could you review where that is being done? Certainly. So essentially, it's the entire 12,000, uh, it's actually about 13,000 square feet of the entire um, front area that uh, is being outlined. 
Above the siltation barrier will be uh, mechanically um, removal of the invasive species. Um, within the siltation barrier and the board of vegetated, that would be um, hand removed. Um, the mitigation proposes 100 plants and seedlings for the understory, as well as within the wetland uh, area, some additional trees, I believe a total of nine trees. It just seems some of it, to, to be honest with you, John, some of it is sort of uh, integral to the actual project of putting the drive in and is sort of vegetation that one would do and you and it's sort of uh, removed from actually benefiting the, 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 the wetland or, or even the buffer zone. So it was sort of like maybe um, it was a little misleading as to how much remediation is being done. Tell me your concern because um, well I'm not I, it's it's just that to count along the driveway and stuff where you're putting it in whatever you put back in there as remediation it, it's 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 a um, uh, remediation is usually the offset work that you're doing in there not consider the work you're doing in there as part of the offset Are right so. Yep, I understand the question now. So the total required mitigation is 6,621, mm -hmm. and we're proposing uh, over 13,000 square feet of mitigation. So we've, um, we've added an additional 6,000 square feet of mitigation to the, uh, to the project that's not required, and that's throughout the entire understory of that front area outside of the driveway boundaries. Not a bad answer. Um, do any of the commissioners have any thoughts? Um, I, help me orient myself. Which way is the town conservation land? Certainly, That's, it is it is to the right. To the right. Okay. So so it's quite uh, quite a bit removed from where the work will be occurring. Yeah. And we do have that siltation barrier along the entire length of the driveway. There, um, mm -hmm. there is a there is a cross grade there that uh, anything coming. Uh, from the uh, proposed driveway uh, would be um, caught by that siltation barrier. It wouldn't go right. in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the other reason I was asking the question, and I think this is, you know, perhaps as, as we think about it as a, as a commission, you know, as we look at the site and where we get a net overall benefit, um, if there's invasives over along and adjacent to the town conservation land, um, is would that be a um, would we see that as a, um, a a better improvement to the project from an ecological standpoint to have mitigation done on the right hand side of the driveway versus further removed from the town conservation land and and uh, just just asking that that question um, yeah which is I, sort of re reiterating a little bit of where I was headed you, you said it quite a bit better though Judy thank you. Um, I think based on um, Dave Chapman's um, report, yeah. um, most of the in mm -hmm. invasives that are um, essentially overrun the, uh, uh, the understory um, is in that front area. Um, I, I do, there is certainly some off to that right side, uh, but it's nowhere near the density that occurs in that, in that front area. So the, the concern that he rose when he put his plan together was that it is so pervasive in this front area that it will um, continue to grow and spread uh, if it's not stopped at its, at its core. And basically when the house was built, that entire front area appears to have been dug up uh, for uh, underground piping, uh, gas, utilities to go there. There's a utility pole that sits there. Um, so it's not been protected for a very long time. Nick, do you have any thoughts? You're on mute, Nick. You're on mute. I said that answer seemed reasonable to me. Um, if that's where the biggest problem is in terms of invasives and that's where the biggest reduction for the town would come. So I'm, I'm just gonna share a photo of the area that is proposed. So this is, this is the existing, so Comerford Road is down here. This is the existing driveway. Mm -hmm up and this is part of the area that's proposed for the invasives removal. Uh, this is a, there's a lot of uh, 
um, I think it's Pachysandra in here. Oh, is that what that is? Okay. There's Spurge and Pachysandra in there, yes. But there's not a lot of, you know, the buckthorn is, is only really, um, what, what I saw was that it's only really concentrated and, and it's scattered. It's not that, that dense here. Yeah. And, and there's certainly areas over here that I I'm think are more, um, mm -hmm. Let's see. you know, integral to the resource area that would, would benefit from the, so it, it might be worth thinking about John, just, you know, sort of separating some of these areas, you know, you've got this car showing as a, as a mitigation area, as well as this shown as a mitigation area and, you know, areas right up against the driveway shown as mitigation. You may want to landscape those areas and that's fine, but, but, um, uh, it's not really appropriate to call those mitigation um, areas because they're they're so close to the you know surfaces and and really the benefit is if you can do something over closer to the resource areas I think yeah okay yeah, I, yeah as a commissioner I I would I would rather have still meet the standards of the of the the bylaw and the commission but I would I would rather have less um, square footage mitigated. But kind of a higher quality mitigation in terms of elimination of, of invasives. Uh, and let me let me to me, uh, perhaps identification of the most problematic invasives might be a better way of looking at it instead of where mm -hmm. it's being done. But where the biggest problem is in terms of the type of an invasive and the extent of it. It's pretty much all buckthorn out there. Majority. There might be a little bittersweet, but. Um, and is it everywhere? Early buckthorn. Mostly in, in one area, or is it just well, the pictures didn't Nick? The pictures didn't look as though so. it was it was next to the driveway on the left side going in. It looked as though from the third picture that was shown that it was on the right side, which happens to be contiguous with the boundary with the town. And I think that's where Judy and I are coming from, Nick. We're not mm -hmm. trying to overwork this and and have the guy do more than two and a half or whatever he's doing. We're trying to say, let's, let's, let's use your efforts where it's going to have the biggest bang um, right. and, that, and, and go there. I think that's similar to my point, which is where, yeah. where I think it is. I think it is, Nick. And I think, I think we're identifying the right side and saying that the stuff along the driveway has very, it has an impact, but not, not nearly what will happen. And, and frankly, that work has to be done to put the driveway in anyways. Uh, we usually don't see that kind of, of, uh, as a reward, we see uh, going to an area of the property that hasn't been affected that would have a good impact, and it does seem mm -hmm. as though the right side of the driveway. I don't know if you can work that out, John. And uh, I think if you did, you, you you've done an amazing job so far. It would be wonderful if you could see your way clear to do that. Yeah, let me um, let me um, talk to Dave Chapman and kind of get um, a conversation going with him as well as. Um, look at what is to the right of that driveway in the property in terms of buckthorn removal and what that might uh, require. Um, happy to consider that and, and come back with um, the tree armoring um, as well as some comments on that. Uh, that would be great. Plan. Okay. That would, that would be great. And I do want to highlight that we did provide flow, uh, hydraulic flow diagrams between the existing culvert estimated and the proposed replacement. So those were also appended to the uh, narrative. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah. Well, no, you did, you've made huge leaps. Um, and, and, yeah. and I CPW is reviewing that, John. Um, so we should have uh, some, some confirmation on that, that flow analysis from them by the next meeting. Terrific. Well, thank you. You want to continue to the 22nd, I assume. Yes, I would love that. Let's, and, um, let's, keep, let's keep this going. Yeah. Yeah, we're, uh, we're waiting. Uh, we we uh, uh, paid additional fees to the DEP. Um, they should have received the check today, so we should have a DEP number before that time. Great, great. Okay. I think so we're just going to, the right So just to make sure that, um, I think I mentioned this to John, but uh, revised materials for the July 22nd meet need to be in by July 10th. We do have that extra week. That's wonderful. Yeah, it yep. is. All righty. Thank you. Thank you, John. We'll continue until the 22nd. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Commissioners.
Uh, we're moving right along to 688 Sudbury Road, uh, DEP file number 1371532. And um, who is here to, I would assume it was Joan, but she, oh, there she is. You, can you hear me? Only too well. Yes, go. <laughs> okay. So what um, are we so doing then, now? We're along route two. Here we go. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Because I'm getting a uh, message that. Um, oh, you're, we hear you beautifully. Matter of fact, you're shouting at me. Okay, and you can see me as well. <laughs> well I used okay. To. All right. All right, so the uh, first notice of intent um, is, uh, wait a minute, is an ecological restoration project to remove Phragmites um, from a population along Route 2. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Joan Ferguson, uh, 62 Neshoba Road. I'm the chair Thank of the Land Conservation Trust. Um, so uh, this is a Phragmites removal project. Uh, I'm sure you've all driven along Route 2 and, and seen this over the years. Um, we've been, sad to say, uh, started working on this in 2013, and then um, the order of conditions we had ran out. So, so here we are again. Um, and the proposal is for um, an application of, of rodeo, a foliar application, um, with some ex expected follow-up within two years, because it never seems to succeed in the first year. Um, and what, what, what else would you like, like to hear? I, I honestly don't have much of any questions on this. You're using Rodeo, you're going to, um, getting rid of Phragmites, great project. Um, is any of the, do any of the other commissioners have any thoughts on this? Uh, the only question I have just for uh, education is, uh, is, is this a approach different than what you had tried uh, in 2013? Yes, it's sort of a, a checkered history. We'd, we'd started trying to do um, injection and it was going to take maybe a five-year span. Um, it started out the first two years did pretty well. The third year it looked as though uh, the previously treated areas were being recolonized uh, recolonized from the existing population. It was like we couldn't keep up with it. Um, so then we were going to go with a foliar treatment. Um, and then we, uh, the contractor missed the window and then disappeared. Um, so that was just sort of an unfortunate um, uh. sequence. So, we, so the, the process was interrupted. Um, we brought in John Bakewell to look at it to see if maybe, you know, we could, should just try and contain it rather than sort of eradicate it. Um, and, and ultimately, um, I think that seemed like, um, could go on for a very long time. So we thought, uh, we would just try and eradicate it, you know, with a foliar treatment mm -hmm. and do it, do the follow up and see if we could, um, you know, control it more permanently by doing that. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I don't, Nick, are you all set? I am, it's fine with me. Is there anyone out there in the outer world have any questions on that are, that are here? Please, or any thoughts? Please come forward. I don't see anyone. I'll give a few more seconds here. We do have a, we do have a motion uh, prepared. Um, mm -hmm. I don't see anyone that does. Yeah, well, uh, one of the commissioners, please do me the favor of making a motion. Sure, um, I make a motion to uh, issue an order of conditions for DEP file 137-1532, um, which is location 68B Sudbury Road um, with findings A and B standard conditions one through 19, special conditions 20 through 42. Do I have a second? I have a second. All right, we must roll call. Uh, Nick, how would say you? Aye. Judy? Aye. And I'm yes as well, that's unanimous. And therefore 
the notices uh, is issued. Uh, moving right along, we don't have a DE file number, but it is 892 Fairhaven Hill Road. It's an <coughs> by CLCT, and it looks like Joan's going to carry the carry the weight on this one as well. We actually do. Sorry, Greg, we do have a file number. It's um, 1533. 1533. Coincidentally, follows 32 now, doesn't it? Right. Okay, right. Joan, what's cooking here? Okay, this is another uh, ecological Joan, restoration. Joan Ferguson still lives at the same address, I assume. That's true, and I'm still the chair of the land trust. Um, okay. And I was able to find the speaker and turn it down, but can you hear, hear me now? You're perfect, you're perfect. Please, Good. go. Okay. Um, so this is slightly different, but it's still trying to control an invasive, and this is in the land trust Wright Woods property. Um, and where, amazingly enough, we don't have a large number of invasives, so we uh, are trying to control the ones that are making incursions. And this is a, one of the more problematic areas uh, where there's uh, buckthorn that's grown in, in at the edge of the wetlands and into the buffer zone. Um, and, you know, as, as, as it's buckthorn does, it's more scattered throughout um, the woods. So these are the areas where it seems to be concentrated. Um, so we have hired um, parterre associates to come in and do uh, mechanical pulling, but mostly in the areas shown here, it will be cut and dab because, um, you know, the buckthorn there is pretty good sized now, um, you know, an inch to maybe sometimes two inches or more trunks on them. Um, so anyway, um, that's, that's the plan. Um, and again, there'll probably be some follow-up um, because there's quite a seed bank there, but I think uh, the follow-up um, work can be done uh, with, you know, with hand pulling. You're, you're gonna stockpile the, what you pull? Uh, in, um, in, talk, just talk a teeny bit about that. Okay, uh, what we think is going to happen is we'll take it, uh, they'll take it outside of the buffer zone and um, they'll probably, you know, cut the bigger pieces into lengths and stockpile those and, um, and also, you know, pile up and create sort of a brush pile of the, the rest of the vegetation um, from the buckthorn if we can get to it fast enough, you know, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. then it, sh it should be fine because uh, the berries are just starting to appear now and they won't have matured. Um, you're going to take that, you're going to take all that out of the buffer zone. Yeah, it'll definitely be out of the buffer zone. Okay. Hey, just, just a curiosity question, but you remember years, a few years back, quite a few, maybe half a dozen years back or so, um, some fences were put in this area uh, mm -hmm. to isolate deer out of it. Just any update on that? Any thoughts on that? Have you heard anything on that, how that's working? Uh, no, um, because even when they put it on in, which I think was three years ago, maybe we're in the fourth year, even at the time they said they wouldn't expect to see anything for five years. Okay. Um, so, you know, they still know it's there and we periodically yeah. look at it and make sure it's still intact. So no yeah, deer yeah. getting in, but we are, you'll see that the one area on the plan yeah. Uh, there, there's the deer exclosure area, and then next right. to it is the control area. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we have to <laughs> we have to make sure we don't do uh, invasive control in their control area. Um, Correct. So that's that's the only wrinkle here. But if you do it outside, then you'll kind of skew it. It'll look like oh, look at the invasives. The, the, the deer ate the invasives, but we know that's not the case. No, well, we won't be. We will not be in their control area. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right, all right. Enough. All right. That. Yeah, yeah. Um, just was curious. Um, any other questions from the commission? No. Uh, any questions from the public on this? Let's give it a good wait, okay? Mm -hmm. If not... Would one of the commissioners may be willing to make a motion? I appreciate it. Go for it, Nick. You have to unmute, Nick. 
Okay, I move that we close and issue an order of conditions for uh, Concord Land Trust. Uh, let's see which address here. Uh, 892 Fairhaven Road, DEP file number 1371533. Uh, including findings A through D, uh, standard conditions one through 19, and special conditions uh, 20 through 44. Do I have a second? Second. I will make the roll call. Nick, I'll say you. Aye. Judy? Aye. And I'm I as well, Eric. Therefore, it is unanimous. Thanks, John, very much. Okay, ha thank you. Happy, Thanks. happy pulling, happy pulling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks to everybody. Thank, thank you a lot. Uh, that brings us to our next uh, folks, which on my sheet doesn't have a DEP phone number, um, which is uh, 676 Monument Street, uh, Fen School property. Um, who is here to help us with this? Yes. Hi, this is Dwight Dunk, uh, Principal at Epsilon Associates here representing the Fen School. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Great. May I ask you, do we have any here, anyone here from the Fenn School uh, in case we have questions for, uh, for the school itself? Yes, right here, Dave Platt. Thank you, Dave. All right, Dwight, please continue. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, the, first of all, we did submit the um, Proof of mailings to the abutters to the office so that uh, all abutters have been notified. Um, just wanted to take care of that administrative piece. Um, also, um, as you noted, there's no DEP file number issued yet, uh, so we know it will be continued. Uh, but we'd like to take this opportunity to present the project and receive any um, feedback questions uh, from the commission members. And um, so, with that, I'll begin. The uh, Fen School. Um, has a, a handful of canoes that are stored on a temporary rack, um, a non-permanent rack uh, near the river's edge. Um, I don't know if this, oh, can you see my cursor? I don't know if no. it shows no. up on there. Okay, but it, it's down. Um, Delia, Delia will do, Delia sure. knows that. <laughs> okay, um, and it's, it's down in the area between the wetland and the property line along the um, Concord River. And the purpose here is to install a seasonal um, float for launching and landing canoes um, so that the students can access the river uh, without the repeated, um, you, you know, um, pedestrian access down the bank and into the land underwater uh, to launch the canoes and then again to land the canoes. So we look at this as being uh, the Fen School wanting to be a good steward of the land by having this uh, float system in uh, gangway to avoid the uh, access down the bank um, and into the river with the canoes. Um, how, how, how many, how many, if I might interrupt you, just how many canoes are we talking about and how long have they been using that currently as a canoe site? Yep, there are, um, I believe the school has six canoes. And um, David, I forget the actual number of years, but probably a couple of years that they've had the canoes and have been okay. using them. Okay. Just about a year. Okay, okay. a year. Yep. Okay. And Delia, I don't know if you want to go to the next, to the plan sheet. Great. Oh, Connor, I need your help. <laughs> Connor. Connor, I need your help, please. Great. Um, this is the um, basically the site prep plan. And what it's showing here is the overall layout of the so uh, floating dock and the uh, sono tubes that will be used for the gangway to- Dwight, um, Dwight, let me interrupt you just a second. Sure. Who's ever talking to their son, Connor, could you please mute your mic? Yes, Karen, I, I just muted her. She got booted out of the meeting. Okay. All right. And um, the- Sorry, Joy. Yep, yeah, that's fine. And really what this plan is showing is during the installation, uh, the, the uh, initial installation with, for the sono tubes, there would be um, uh, straw wattles or um, 
you know, some type of sedimentation control while the footings are dug for the sono tubes just to contain anything um, after the tubes are um, set and the holes are backfilled, those will be removed and the trees would also be protected. And if we can go to the next sheet. And this is the um, layout of the dock. The dock, um, a seasonal dock, um, it would be installed in the spring, left in place uh, throughout the spring and summer, and then used again in the fall term, and then removed for the winter season. The uh, What's proposed here is a segmental dock. Essentially, it's a um, residential type dock. We provided some of the information from the um, manufacturer in the notice of intent. And subsequent to that, we received specific cut sheets from the contract from the manufacturer and sent that off to um, Delia earlier this week. It's um, three six by eight segments um, that are the floats and then a five foot by 25 foot um, gangway from the up from the shore out to the floats. The, the, uh, to keep the floats in place are four uh, posts that would be augered into the um, riverbed. Uh, and that's basically to keep the floats in place, um, you know, so they don't move with the, with the current. The, um, and so these are, uh, again, as I said, they're floating. What's shown here on the plan is, um, Delia, I don't know if you can zoom into this a little bit more. Great. Um, as you all know, there was an order of resource area delineation uh, that um, is still effective. And that um, boundary of the BVW is shown in this um, uh, solid with a single dot line um, identified with the ORAD number. Um, that's the limit of BVW. Um, and then we have bank along the river, the solid line along the river at about elevation 12 was the water elevation when Sam Yotis did their survey this spring. And then we have the bathymetry um, right along the river's edge. And Do we what, have deline delineation of the 25 and 50 foot and 100 foot? Um, the, um, we don't, we don't. yeah, we, we can add, we will add that to the drawing. I mean, this seems very focused in on this little area here rather than you know, sort of step back and see how it fits. But Correct. Yeah. Well, this is where all the, the structure is, is located. I understand, um, yeah. And um, the float itself is about 18 to uh, 24 inches above the water surface. So what we have here is the stono tubes would keep the gangway um, a, a minimum of three inches above the grade. The grade slopes down towards the river and the uh, surface um, of the floats is about 18 to 24 inches above yeah. the water level. And the purpose here is to keep the gangway uh, from encountering the, um, the surface of the land so that we don't have any alteration to BBW or bank. That's why we indicated on the um, NOI form that there's no alteration there. Um, there's no need to excavate and this is to be um, elevated above the land surface. Um, the float itself at the easterly end um, extends this small dimension here is a little over a foot. So, and then the floats are six feet. So, you know, seven and a half to eight feet from the water's uh, edge to the east end. And then on the west end, we, again, we have the six feet with um, say 18, so 24 feet. And the river here is at its narrowest point is 135 feet wide. So it's a, uh, uh, not extending out into the river very far. Um, and so that's the, um, the, propose, the proposal of the structure. Um, the posts themselves, as I said, are temporary. Uh, just when the boat, when the float is installed, um, the comp, they're only um, an inch and a half. This manufacturer showing an inch and a half diameter. Um, other manufacturers, they're anywhere from two and a half to three inch diameter. Um, so it's less than one square feet of land underwater um, occupied by the, uh, by the uh, post. 
So that's the the um, I, yeah, proposed I, project, and then to much. to mitigate um, for the access would be um, through the field. The field is uh, mowed um, uh, by a uh, it's hayed um, by a farmer. Um, it's you know basically uh, agricultural use, and it is mowed on a um, periodic basis uh, as a meadow as a hay field and what we proposed is having a 10-foot uh, wide path that would be mowed on a regular basis uh, so that the students um, and faculty can get down there without wading through tall uh, meadow grass and um, then in terms of overall mitigation we've identified uh, pollinator planting uh, meadow community that set 50 feet off the wetland boundaries um, so that there's over an acre of pollinator meadow uh, to be established on the site uh, to as mitigation for the, the dock um, being, um, as I said, less than one square foot of land underwater and then the gangway over, uh, elevated over the BVW and, and bank. So that's the, the project is proposed with the mitigation and with that, um, I'll um, well, I, I think my, answer any questions. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, my first question is, this just seems inordinately um, sophisticated to launch six kayaks. You need 24 feet to launch a kayak. I, I don't well, understand the, the, the size and magnitude of, of the ramping and to, to put a kayak in. Sure. Well, it's a couple of canoes. An average canoe is about 14 feet long. So in order to have two canoes um, on the riverward side of the float, um, so that, you know, loading them, you know, kind of two at a time, that would be about 28 feet. So this, that's why it's 24 feet. So there could be two canoes um, being there at one time, getting loaded, offloaded. And so the, the, the gangway is five feet wide to give enough width so that the um, students can carry the canoes, you know, down the gangway onto the floats. Um, and that width is also driven by, uh, when you look at the height of the gangway above the uh, riverbed, it's greater than three feet, greater than five feet. So uh, for safety purposes, um, the engineer was recommending to have the, um, the handrails on either side. So that, that then means we need somewhat of a wider gangway in order to get the canoes down there. So are we, are we limiting, are, we, are you asking us if we put a provision here that limiting this to six canoes? Is that what we're doing here? Um, we were the limiting six, it six? To, to six canoes because the, the school currently owns six, but the, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out. I'm trying to figure out the impact of of usage here, and it, it would make a huge difference if you're, if it's just the six that the school owns. Um, that's one impact. Whereas if it's the six that the school owns, plus anybody in the school community that has kay kayaks and canoes or or paddle boards coming down, it it changes the impact. So I'm just I'm just asking if we restricted this to the six. Um, uh, school ca canoes, is that a satisfactory restriction? I, I think the um, more satisfactory restriction would be to limit it to the school-owned canoes um, in the event that they, you know, get more than six canoes, but um, it's, it's for the purpose of the, uh, you know, it's for the students um, to launch canoes, and as we mentioned, the float also, you know, provides some opportunities to get onto the river and um, you know, kind of uh, collect water samples, you know, um, look at aquatic uh, life within the river. But you uh, I, like I, run, run a classroom or something of that. Correct, thing. correct. But the, the intent here is for it to be the school owned canoes. And um, I don't think um, limiting it to six, but to limiting it to school owned canoes. We might want to consider a, a a cap number. Six may not yeah. be the right number, but I, I I just don't want it to be an open ended. This is sort of an isolated use on a fairly good sized piece of land, and I don't know what else the school is envisioning 
Um, you know, you hear all kinds of rumors. I've heard people say potential play fields downstream sometime and all that, which is, you know, your prerogative. But it's just you want to know what we're, we, when we do this segmented this way, it suddenly accumulate. It can accumulate. I'm not, this has nothing to do with the Fed school, but just in general, when you have this kind of land, you want right. to well, kind of know what the master plan is. Right. Well, that's, the, you know, the, the idea is if you have six canoes going in, in and out on a, you know, um, throughout the school week and, you know, spring and fall, that that's quite a bit of traffic over the bank. And we believe that the flow, right. but you know, it, really limits that. Um, it, it is a school and you could end up having skull and, 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 and rolling lessons and all, all sorts of stuff to, 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 to enter the regatta in, in there on the trials. I mean, that would be a huge impact from what we're envisioning right this moment. So we might want to think of some parameters around usage just so that we all are comfortable and the neighborhoods and everybody else is comfortable as to what we've really permitted here is my point. But, and I think you got, I, I think you and David understand. I'm not trying, I'm just trying to get definition, you know, uh, to, you know, we want to quantify the impact if we can. Um, the canoe rack is, where, where is that going to, is that going to be, is that out of, the, the riverfront and out of the, uh, where is that going to, where's its final home? It's, um, it, it's currently in that, um, you know, southeast corner near the, near the water, uh, near the water's edge. We can keep that outside the 25 foot zone, um, but we'd like it to be, you know, somewhat near the water so that we're not having to uh, transport the canoes a long distance. I don't know if we'd consider that a structure, and, yeah. and that would would that be a, a a seasonal thing, and then be brought in? Um, y yes, you're not going to leave the canoes out there all winter, I wouldn't presume. No. So it, that would be a seasonal usage in the 50 foot, but not inside the 25. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Correct. Yeah, uh, Greg, can I have a question around the same topic? I noticed any, like, any time, Judy, any time. There's two boxes. The picture we have of the canoes, uh, there's two boxes that looks like close to the canoes. Um, could you describe what those are and whether those are permanent structures? Um, those are likely the, where the paddles and, and PFDs are kept and they're not permanent. They would move. Uh, which, um, I'm just, what are you? Um, we have some pictures in. Oh, our, you're looking at the photos. Back. Okay, let in, me switch. Yeah. Pictures in the in the in the yeah, back. Let again. me look at the. Uh, so the those photos. are photos that staff provided from the site visits. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, okay. I don't think those are in the. Oh, okay, okay. I can go to the photos that you have in the application. I don't know. I don't know if you have any of the. Um, uh, I don't think we, so. We didn't have any of the. Um, I don't think so. Uh, of the um, rack. No, I didn't think so. But none of that, David, is, is permanent. That's seasonal usage. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, our photograph, too, um, that's in uh, figure 6B. It just, uh, there's the picnic, there's the picnic table, and then you can just see the corner of the rack. Um, can you see this photograph? Yeah. I can, yes. Okay. Yes. So there's a picnic table when there's the canoe. Right. right. And, and right. we selected the location so that, um, you know, there's no need for cutting any vegetation. The, the gangway um, it goes through the trees and, um, you know, so there's no need to cut any vegetation in order to install the gangway. So uh, just a question Go on ahead. the season. Yeah, question on the seasonality. Um, so when the season is over, the dock, the gangway, the canoe rack, the bins that life jackets and paddles are stored in, all that will be removed and put place where? Um, that would be, uh, you know, up on the, probably on the main campus. I think that should be specified to, that it's going to be certainly outside of the the buffer zone, and I don't know whether we care about the riverfront area in that regard, uh, Delia, but I, I would say that at least it wants to be defined in some nature, because um, <laughs> we don't want them just set on the bank um, sure. in, in the buffer. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the other thing is that, as you know, this river could be pretty flashy and the 100-year flood, you know, so certainly it wants to be 
install, you know, they want to yeah. be kept outside of that too um, when they're being stored off season. Well, either that or someone downstream is going to thank you very much. Yeah, and and how how are the how is the dock and the gangplank removed um, at the end of the season? And and then how you know what method is it? You know how's it transported back and put yep. in place? The um, the reason that we went with the segmental dock is because each of those segments um, is about two hundred and fifty pounds. Uh, we had looked at actually constructing with smaller segments. Um, so that the maintenance staff can float them out and then lift them out of the out of the river, um, but with the with the uh, gangway, you know, coming you know landing onto it, uh, the manufacturer suggested the six by eight floats. So the intent would be to um, you know pull them out of the river and then pr um, with one of the school's uh, pieces of equipment, you know. Um, to trailer it away, you know, I think they have some, uh, I want to call them gators, but they're the um, kind of the heavy duty, you know, golf cart, John Deere type carts that could certainly haul these um, out of the, uh, of the riverfront area. Oh, okay. Uh, they can, we, uh, we made them so that you could have, uh, you know, four, four workmen could pick them up in the corners and carry them and then, uh, yeah. you know, if they need to be hauled off, they can with just this, that type of small vehicle. Okay, so we, we, do we need some sort of documentation, uh, something in the plan about how that equipment's going to be accessing the, uh, the area, the riverfront area and the, the 50 foot zone? It's again, it's the John Deere, you know, those small John Deere type. Uh, um, you kind of. You'd, you know, carry, you'd carry the pieces up the bank and put yep. it on the, the John right. Deere on dry right. land, on upland, and drive yeah. away. Is that the right. thing? And, and they could I travel that. I think Nick would just like to see, uh, and, and it's a valid point, if, 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 if that's the intent, um, then, then maybe something of that nature gets spelled out. Obviously, Gator is a trade name, but right. I, I get what <laughs> you're talking about. I get what I was concerned talking. about what the equipment is, about then how close it's getting to the river and whether or not it's you know, going to be inside the 100-foot or 50-foot zones. Yeah, I think it clearly would be if it was going to be at the, at the, you know, right up where the, what this picture shows would be clearly within the 50. Right, yeah. then it, and it has to be in the plan and the impact has to be documented, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I think at least has to. Be, I think it would be wise to put in the plan that the, that your plant that they manually will be removed to the to the to the uh, uplands, not mm -hmm. really uplands but, and 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 transported from there in a small machine, i.e., gator, etc. And then and then on the plan show, or at least have a, a location determined. So we know where they're going to, all that material is, is going to be stored off site. Go ahead, Nick. Exactly. And what uplands means? I mean, does it mean the 100 foot or? What? No, it exactly. doesn't. It, 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 exactly. I misspeak when There's I say true uplands. There? Is somebody still talking to Conrad or? No, that's my daughter in the background. <laughs> oh, okay. No ice cream. Um, all right. Well, I think Nick's right. I think we should, we, I think we should identify because all that's coming out. Where's it going to go? And, and just get that all known. Um, I think we should get a recommendation from the school in terms of what, you know, I would be somewhat uncomfortable to, to say that it, 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 an unlimited number of, of canoes, but I, I get your point of wanting to have some uh, flexibility in that, but it would certainly be wonderful uh, to have some control over that. And, and if it exceeded that for, and no, there were no problems, I mean, our door is always open, you know, to modify. Um, but I, leaving it blank is, is is problematic to me. I think extending onto the, the field, um, from what I understand, we have not had really good luck in pollination technique. Something screaming here, but pollination technique. Um, and wondered what who recommended that, and would there be another? Uh, remediation that might work better, mitigation that might work better. Yeah, um, actually I met with um, Delia back um, around the holidays, just probably just before the holidays and you know we were talking about um, the mitigation because we're, um, like I said, really the um, the design here, the impact is really limited to the post to hold the floats in place. 
and we thought that would be a, um, a, a reasonable uh, mitigation technique. And um, I, Delia did have some good questions um, other than just overseeding that area with the pollinator seed mix. And um, I have a couple of ideas. I have a call into a um, ecological restoration landscape firm, uh, their foreman who's an ecologist to get some um, input from him as to some techniques. Uh, you know, what I'm thinking of is maybe, you know, cutting it very short the first time and either slice seeding it or a shallow uh, disc with a seed. Um, these species, many of the species are, um, are a little finicky in germinating and often need to be overwintered before they'll germinate in the spring. And, and uh, so I, I understand um, what you're talking about, but I'd like to get some input from someone who specializes in, the, in ecological restoration and uh, provide uh, a written response um, with the right. approach of how to do that. Yeah, yeah, we've had, the town's actually tried itself and hasn't had it hasn't had great success. So we're, it, you know, we're not saying no, but it if there's a better technique or something that would even uh, work a little better, that would that, that would be interesting to hear about. Yeah, yeah my um, experience has usually been for overall meadow, and you know that um, if if the species mix isn't perfect for pollinator, that wasn't the intent. <laughs> so um, <laughs> right, exactly. What the, the now in terms of mowing this. Um, and haying it, is this, who does that? And, and is this actually being used for, for agriculture? The re, and I'll get to the bottom of my question, why I'm asking is that um, a, a field like this would probably be best mowed in very early spring, that it would winter over and take care of all the species that would, that need the coverage getting through the winter. So you wouldn't mow in the fall, although mowing in the fall would be a second, um, uh, alt would be the second best, but mowing mid May, June, July um, uh, is problematic to many reasons to have a field uh, for ecological reasons. Obviously for hay reasons, it's a different issue. So yeah. is, there any, is there anything you can talk about that would talk about it from an ecological standpoint uh, more so than uh, just getting, uh, and there's nothing wrong with getting hay, but you know, you yeah. get my point. Right, I get you where you're coming from. Um, my discussions with the school is, you know, they have a farmer who uh, mows this, you know, for hay purposes. Uh, first cut hay is usually the preferred hay um, because of its, uh, I don't want to say value in terms of dollars, but it's nutri nutritional value. Nutritional value, sure. um, So um, that's usually, you know, probably June, you know, this, you know, uh, in terms of the haying for, for that purpose. Uh, for ecological purpose, um, some of the species do better if they're cut, like you say, early spring. Others do better if they're cut late fall. Um, but what I think we could do is, again, um, as part of the pollinator meadow areas, identify when those areas would be cut. Um, and those could be marked by with some um, wooden you know, stakes to you know, field markers so that the farmer knows the hay field from the pollinator field and um, have the pollinator um, areas cut at the uh, best time for those species. Okay. Yeah, it'd be nice if they were willing to, to, to think of it more ecologically. But do you make a lot of money on the hay? I mean, just um, you know, the, the property has been in uh, 61A for Correct. over a decade. And so we're literally historically just maintaining what's exactly how it's been maintained. Um, and I think as time goes by, uh, the, that designation will shift. And in the meantime, you know, we need to maintain it that way um, as per the town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no harm, no, no harm asking. And I no, Yes. So just so just so I understand that. So per the town, you need to maintain it in agricultural use. Yeah. So agricultural use, and then if we shift to sixty one B, and I can't really, I, I'm stepping a little outside my zone here, but um, that that's the idea is that when it's in agricultural use in that tax de tax designation, it still needs to be maintained that way, um, and then as that as that transfers. Uh, that 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 way of maintaining it can also go away. 
And so okay. I don't know about the differences between chapter 61A and 61 in terms of switching out of those, but it really, it would be nice if that uh, field could be actually, you know, a, a, it's a great opportunity for education for the students to have it be, uh, you know, a, a habitat, a bobolink habitat, as well as, you know, pollinators beyond what's, you know, being proposed. So if, if the mowing can be, put into a time frame like Greg was suggesting, I think that would be a huge benefit. Yeah, think about it. Think about it, David. I mean, we're, we're, we, we certainly have another meeting to get through, but if, you, if, if the school could find a way to even compromise a, a, you know, a certain distance from the river in that regard, it would probably be quite helpful. Um, mowing through it, I think is, to my way of thinking, I'm speaking to the commissioner here, that makes sense. I mean, you, you don't want people you, you, you want to control the, the, the walkthrough and you also don't want it to be, you know, kids get to the canoes and, and, and you know, paddle kicks all over the river uh, right. while they're, well, you know, that just is nonsense. So mowing that makes, makes a, a logical sense. Um, any other thoughts, questions from the, the commission? Um, yes, I, ha I had a couple of questions yet. Um, you, we talked about the school use of the dock. Um, I assume the docks, you know, gonna, what's going to be up when there's going to be people not associated with the school on the river, um, was there any assessment and thought given to um, people paddling down river, stopping at the dock, getting off? There's a nice picnic table there. Uh, and the reason I ask is that, you know, if there's people starting to come in from the river up, that could have an impact on the resource area. I was wondering what your thoughts were about that and your assessment, um, whether that's acceptable or thoughts on how to mitigate or prevent that? Um, that? That is a good question. I'll be honest, I did not think about uh, other folks uh, using that, but I think what we could certainly, um, the post uh, for holding the docks in place will need to be fairly tall. Um, we need to talk with the manufacturer about that just so that if there is a large flood event, we don't want the floats coming off those uh, those posts and we could easily put a, I think there could be a signage that this is, you know, this is a school, a dock for Fen school um, and for Fen school use. I'll, I'll, I will tell you honestly, Judy, you know, we, the, there is, you know, people right now just paddling across, get down and come onto that part of the property all, all by themselves. So mm -hmm. we, we do have signage down there that says this is private property, no trespassing, but we also are, doing our best to keep it, you know, not full of signage. And so. Um, sure, yeah, I appreciate that. You want it to look natural. Well, it's but. a balance. And, you know, I, I think part of this is, frankly, long before Fen owned this property, this was a stopping place for people who paddled on the river and, and stopped. And in fact, when they were filming Little Women, they came to look at the spot as a, this is exactly where we want to pull off the, the, the river and shoot the scene, right? And so mm -hmm. I think it's a very, iconic spot um, and one honestly we're trying to protect because what we've seen in just the short time we've been there is the more and more we're standing on the riverbank and taking water samples from the riverbank and standing around that you know we're in the first year and we're seeing you know effects that we don't want to have and we think that you know we really think it's important to get the kids on the water and and teach them about this ecosystem and that's genuine and so by doing this we're able to do it a lot more safely and also protect the riverbank and so we think the risks of that you know and and letting the continued use with the one-off uses off the river is likely to could just continue even with signage um, and so it's just one of those things we have to try to manage and you know hopefully not become too big of an issue. But, you know, I think if it, if it, if it were to become an issue, it would be, you know, a problem for the school on so many levels that we just have to deal with it differently. Okay. Yeah, you, you All right. Secure, yeah, I was just curious about issues. your thoughts on it. Yeah. No, it's a good, it's a good question. My mm -hmm. suggestion would be you put up a sign that says $35 every 15 minutes. 
Um, and then you, you know, people. And I was thinking they put that as alligator as down there and yeah, saw exactly. The yeah, but it's, like a good, it. it's a good question, and, and, and a doc like that will attract attention and and make it even more uh, attractive for certain people. It wouldn't. I, I don't. I don't know as I'd pull up to a doc because I'm not kayaking, so I can pull up to an aluminum dock, but. Uh, others might go ahead, Judy. We're going to say yeah, this. yeah. And, and the other the other question I have, which you alluded to uh, a little bit already, which is the reason for putting the dock in, was the erosion on the bank from the students going down to collect water samples. Um, is there any thought about putting any like plantings in or anything to kind of prevent um, the kids from not going, you know, going down to the water's edge anyway? Um, you know, having a six year six year old grandson. He's attracted to water, regardless of what you tell him. <laughs> I, and I, I uh, so I didn't know if there was any thought or was there any, any um, concerns about uh, as the kids are down there waiting to get on their canoes, they still might be going down the bank into the river. To the river. Yeah. They are middle school students, so hopefully they would. Um, well, I think that might, yeah. <laughs> they'd understand the, the rules and would follow them a little better. <laughs> Yeah, I would say the tough part about doing too much planning as Delia would, I think, hopefully, I don't know if she would agree, but I think one of the tough parts is the river does rise a lot right there. And, and so we're, you know, we wouldn't, I don't, I don't, we've had, we've tried to have success planning in this other corner area. Mm -hmm. um, and most of those trees are, you know, literally planted underwater. Um, and, you know, I think we're comfortable exploring things like that. I just, we'd want to to be successful and not just, you know, uh, I'm not sure how successful it would end up being with the with the the height of the and the height, you know, how the river fluctuates yeah. right there at the riverbank. Okay. So it, um, it. Any other questions from the commission or anything else from Dwight or David? If not, I'd like to see what the audience has to say. Is there anyone out there that has a question, comment, or whatever one might have? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to speak, if I may. Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Richard Chazen. Um, I live at 131 Car Road with Dr. Susanna Bedell. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have submitted a letter to you, um, and it's a short letter, and I'd like to just take this time to read it into the record, if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think that's fine. It is. A we did. I certainly read it um, and I appreciate your input. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I'm sure you can read. Thank, thank you. Uh, dear Natural Resource Commission, uh, I have lived at 131 Car Road adjacent to 676 Monument Street and Fenn School since 1996. I am writing to share my concerns about the construction of a dock gangway at, three, at 676 Monument Street. My object, objection to this project are based both on an interest in protecting the Concord River and its wetlands, and on the prior history of segmental expansion of projects by the Fen School. Although any dock is likely to disturb wetlands and wildlife, this location is of particular concern because it would sit across a narrow riverway from the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. The birds, the great heron, wood ducks, who sit at the edge of Great Meadows often fly to the opposite bank. The blanding turtle, a threatened species known to be in the Great Meadows, may suffer mortality from landscape fragmentation. That's a quote from the Great Meadows website. There are countless other examples of impacts on flora and fauna about which you are aware. Furthermore, review of the plans suggest the proposed dock is more like a commercial marina than a canoe launch. The problem of the dock itself are also numerous, reducing light penetration, directly disturbing aquatic life, and altering the water flow of the river. Dredging the river may alter the shoreline, and repeated dredging may be necessary to maintain the dock. Such dredging would disturb river, se river sediment, which may contain excess levels of toxic metals. In addition to these concerns, there is a pattern by the, by the Fen School of incrementally increasing their footprint and failing to provide a master plan. In the past, permits have been given Fen permission to establish guidelines as they see fit. We will elaborate on these issues if you consider them relevant. Once there is a dock, will there be a boathouse, parking, parties, 
excursions and other activities inimical to the wild and scenic river and the wildlife refuge nearby? Will further disruption of the adjacent wetland occur because a permit gives permission to slowly extend the river footprint? The history of 676 Monument Street is interesting as the previous owner had filled and drained the wetland theoretically to obtain an agricultural exemption to grow hay. Meanwhile, opening up the river view and landing for his hillside home and then selling the property to Fenn. Fenn has already destroyed wetland and further expanded their field by mowing and destroying habitat of bobolink birds sighted there. Fenn has previously encroached on wetlands and riverfront when building a synthetic turf athletic field. The snow on the field is plowed in the winter, pushing crumb rubber into the river. In the fall, leaves are blown from the field into wetlands. With the leaves is crumb rubber. Trash from the field blows into the woods and down to the river where we regularly collect it. The cumulative impact on the river needs to be evaluated. The application submitted by Fenn lacks detail about the plan to develop the property at 676 Monument Street. It is appropriate that a master plan be submitted as part of a review of this application. The only responsible way to fully evaluate the impact of a dock is to fully understand the total land use. Will there be roads and parking areas that generate harmful stormwater runoff? Where will the dock and boats be stored? Will there be continuous use of the docks as, there is, as, as is the case with the synthetic turf field? Given the history of land use by Fenn, it is likely that the intent of this dock is for more than educational activities. There is already an easy landing spot on the river that would allow small groups of students to explore the river's wonders without destroying the habitat. Um, that is a letter which we submitted to you, and I thank you for letting me read it into the record. Um, as I listened to the testimony here today, a number of other questions uh, arose, and let me just briefly run through them. Um, there is a great deal debris of debris, as you know, that, that, that floats downstream. And it looks to me like the configuration of the dock is such that a, a great deal of, of debris is going to accumulate on that dock and I would like to know what the plan is if this is approved to manage that and to dispose of it. Um, we happen to have a canoe and a kayak on our property which we've used for over 20 years and we've never had any issue with launching that canoe or kayak into the river. Uh, our topography at the river edge is very similar to Fens and I see no reason why uh, a dock of this substance uh, would need to be uh, 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 constructed to accommodate six canoes. Uh, I heard discussion that this will be used by Fenn for educational purposes. Uh, as I think you know, Fenn has a, a very uh, large summer camp program. Is this gonna be used by the summer camp as well? I believe they have almost 300 children who attend that camp during, during peak, peak season. Uh, the gangway, is the gangway going to be removed as well or just the dock itself? Uh, I believe uh, the applicant stated that the dock would be stored on the main campus. Where on the main campus is it going to be stored? We are surrounded by Fenn. They are located on all sides of our property. And the last thing I want to look at, uh, along with the synthetic turf field, the ropes course, uh, their storage facility, is a pile of uh, docks that are going to be sitting uh, on some lawn next to our house for, for six months a year. Uh, uh, i just like to emphasize the need for a master plan. I don't know how you can review this application strictly in the context of a dock. We have all heard rumors about Fenn developing this property for athletic fields and other uses. I think it is absolutely critical in order to assess the impacts of this dock to look at what the total land use is going to be. It is not gonna be just a hay field. I'm sure Fenn did not buy this property just to grow hay and to have access to the river. I'm sure they have other plans for this property. And I think it's critical 
that this commission ask for that information and then review this doc application in that context, not in a segmented way. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'll certainly let the, let the petitioners address those comments if you wish, um, or maybe more appropriately, take note of them and come back with, with some answers. There's some fairly interesting questions raised there as to, as to um, overall usage. Is the summer camp going to use it? I mean, it's one thing to say six or maximum 10, but if they're gonna be used hourly all summer long and all spring and all fall, that's, a, that's an awful lot of usage. So it, there are some good questions there and, and you may wanna answer them now or as I say, make them a little more, uh, we can make that letter available to you as well, of course. Um, yes, we, we have a copy of the letter um, and um, you know, we're, we're continuing it um, for administrative reasons anyways, we, I think we take the opportunity to um, address these comments um, between now and the next meeting. That, that would make sense to me as well. Um, and, and I think, I, I, you know, the, the point is well taken. It, it's sort of my feeling on, on the dock being 24 or 5 feet, whatever it is. And the gang plan, I kind, kind of guess the safety issue of it makes some sense. But um, it does sort of lead you to believe where is this all headed? Where, what is the field? What is the, what is the plan? What, you know, are we, uh, you know is, there a, is there a plan? And if not, um, when would that be, be available? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of the, the sizing of the dock, actually, you know, um, as I mentioned early on, you know, we're, I was working with the engineers um, who are, we, uh, Simiotis, working with them to lay this out. And the thought, as I said, was to be able to put two canoes in at a time so that, you know, students, the teacher can be there helping them get loaded, um, unloaded, and rather than just one canoe at a time. And when you start looking at the length, um, that's really where, you know, the 24 feet came in because that's where you could get two canoes, um, you know, along that length. And, and that's really where that came from was just the idea of two at a time. Um, well, I think you have some issues to work through and some, maybe some suggestions to come back to us with. Um, I have moved my notes. Um, but um, I think we've covered some issues that m you may want to directly address and uh, come back to us. I, I guess you'd want to continue to the 22nd. I'm not sure. Does that work for you? Yes. Yep. Um, we did get, um, you know, I've, some questions, comments from Delia. So we've, you know, um, and that was to provide some additional information relative to the uh, waiver requests for the bylaw. Um, so, and then a couple of other items that we've Yeah, you will be tonight. working in the 25, you will be Correct. working in the 50, so, so you need waivers. But I, I would suggest that if, if you could, uh, it would be quite interesting to, to um, um, look at the, uh, the overall, you know, the gentleman makes a point that you probably didn't buy it for a hayfield. Um, and um, I think we'd want to define how we use these docks so that it, so it doesn't morph into more than an access for Fenn students to use uh, to enjoy the river. Um, I think debris, I, I assume you'd take it, you know, I think you should address that issue, but it's, yeah. that one seems like a no brainer. You obviously, when you take the thing out, you're gonna take the debris, but you've got plenty of students to clean up the river. So um, I would think that would be a no brainer. Uh, any, any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I guess you have until the 10th to get any uh, supporting information in, which is, you got a little bit of a reprieve here, uh, but not a lot, but you got a little. So I look forward to seeing you on the 22nd. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Commission members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, moving along, we are not closing an issue on shore, so we'll jump to two um, certificates of compliance. Um, Aho and uh, Kalmia Woods. Do I have a motion on um, the EP file number 1371477? I make a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for DEP file 1371477 
for 720 Old Bedford Road. 721. Excuse me, 721. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Um, and we're all set on this, Delia, or you wouldn't have put it here. Uh, all those in favor, Judy? Aye. Nick? Aye. And I'm I as well. It's unanimous. Okay, DEP phone number 1371380. Do I have a motion? Well, I'll move that we issue a certificate of compliance for 21B, the Valley Road, DEP file number 1371380. Second. All those in favor? Judy? Aye. Nick? Aye. And I'm aye as well. That's unanimous. Uh, administrative approvals. We have uh, apparently four trees on Muscatiquit 61 that slash 73 Muscatiquit. Um, yes. So the, the, the homeowner had uh, had an order of conditions to do some work, including some invasive species removal. Um, he wanted to remove some Norway maples that were on the, the property, property line. Um, between him and 73 Muscatiquid Road, the former property owner was not willing to see those trees go, but the new property owner is. They're, they're Norways, they're invasive. Um, it's four trees. And uh, so I would recommend that this is something that the commission would That's favor. Yeah. Do I have a motion, please? Make a motion to grant a motion. motion. You don't need Pardon? a motion. So, yeah. Oh, we don't need a motion. Does anybody have a problem? Nope. No problem. Uh, Timber then. I can remember those Norway maples. At this point, I think we're, we've concluded our meeting. Um, motion to adjourn would be appreciated. Second. All those in favor? Aye. I, right across the board, I see three ayes. Uh, and good, good night. Have a great fourth and a safe fourth and stay well all. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.